I'm with Dr. Chris Burns, the CEO of Canadian Battery Technology Company, Navonics. Chris, how are you? I'm great, Matthew. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Navonics and about the work that you uh, that you do in uh, lithium battery production. There. I started the business about 10 years ago, focused on long life battery chemistries when I was doing my PhD with Dr. Jeff Don at Dalhousie University. And we focused on equipment and technologies for extending battery life, really to help support what we saw as this impending electrification revolution for vehicles and energy storage systems. And now we've really become focused on how we can help support the midstream value chain in terms of key materials, anode and cathode materials that are going to be needed as we localize cell manufacturing in North America and reduce our reliance on China. And so we have activities in Nova Scotia, as well as in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we focus on different projects around anode materials and cathode materials, as well as battery technology development. So as you say, uh, you know, you're involved both in the research side of, uh, you know, looking at the lifespan of, of uh, lithium uh, ion batteries, but also in the cathode and anode material space as well. Um, so you're really well positioned to talk about the innovation space in Canada and in the U.S. And I'm wondering if you if you have uh, if there's anything that excites you right now about where uh, battery innovation is going. I think everything excites me. The entire sector is as at the precipice of so much growth and opportunity, not just because of new technology development, but yeah. because of the commitments from the vehicle manufacturers, the government support and the investment that's coming into building an entire new supply chain in the Western world, right? We have been completely reliant on Asia for everything related to battery materials and battery production since essentially the inception of lithium-ion batteries. And so while we look at continuing to invent and innovate in new technologies that will be needed to make batteries better, longer lasting, faster charging, all of these things, I think the most exciting thing is that we're going to deploy such huge scale of this technology over the next five years in North America from essentially a non-existent base. So I wonder then, you know, just sticking with the theme of innovation, if there's anything that you think about that needs to happen, uh, you know, maybe particularly in Canada to help sort of catalyze and, and even reward battery innovation in this country. I think Canada has a really unique opportunity to play in this ecosystem. And we're starting to see more and more investment come to Canada now after, uh, of course, an initial huge investment wave of cell manufacturing into the United States. But we have such great uh, academic programs, research institutions, NRC, things like this that can support the innovation side. Yeah. And then we go all the way upstream to, of course, being a, a resource rich nation with key materials that are needed to support this sector. And so the really exciting opportunity for Canada is to, to bridge that gap and bring the innovation to the raw materials and become a, a significant midstream player in processing and upgrading value add to these minerals and not simply being a, a source of resources for other countries or, or locations to take advantage of that. So then if you touched on the supply chain and going upstream, I wonder if you think about some of the challenges that are in front of us as we try to develop a full uh, supply chain uh, through the midstream. Obviously, we think a lot about zero emission mobility and and the usage of, of batteries for those purposes. And I wonder if you have some thoughts around some of the challenges and maybe some thoughts around overcoming those challenges so that Canada can be kind of a full supply chain supplier uh, in Canada, in North America and globally. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, this is not an easy road, to be clear. And and e-mobility, vehicle fleet, and that transition is going to drive this sector for the next five years. And then we're going to start to see things like energy storage on the grid really become more prolific. But for now, everyone's focus, whether you're upstream, midstream, or downstream, however you want to define that, is on how to support uh, vehicle transition and, and primarily the passenger vehicle transition. And so I think the biggest challenge around all of that is the timing. We are trying to move an industry so quickly here in North America to build from, from infancy to deploying you know, uh, hundreds of gigawatt hours of battery production in the next few years. And at the same time, that means we need to be investing in midstream. While there aren't existing customers downstream for them yet, but it takes time to build the midstream plants. And then we need to be investing in mining, right? And, and extracting resources in, in a sustainable way. 
so that we can support the midstream sector, but the midstream sector doesn't exist yet. So one of the biggest challenges, and it's a role that the government needs to help support, and I think groups like Accelerate will play a significant role in this, is helping to align these investment timelines so we can try to bring an entire value chain online at the same time, not yeah. in stages. And of course, you know, Canada is not an island. We we exist within a, a continent. We've got, uh, you know, a, a, a cross border situation uh, in terms of trade, in terms of our relationship with our with our friends uh, to the south, uh, that necessitates us thinking about a North American battery ecosystem and a North American uh, zero emission vehicle uh, ecosystem. Um, Mnemonics is involved in Canada and in the U.S. in terms of your production. Uh, so you're probably uniquely uh, positioned, if, if at least well positioned, to, to think through what the future of a North American ecosystem can look like. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on, you know, your experience to date and, and where this can go. Absolutely. So we started our involvement in the U.S. in about 2017 when we set up our nanomaterials division, specifically focused on innovative technology for making synthetic graphite, which is right. the best long life anode material to support you know, vehicles and energy storage systems. And so over the past five or six years, since we started that, we have our development and pilot center. We're building out our first mass production site. We were just selected for $150 million of funding from the infrastructure law package. We're applying for funding from the loan program office, all to build, you know, more production to support mm -hmm. this huge growth. And I think that the opportunity set that the United States presents North America as a whole, including Canada, is really to Canada's benefit because we need a larger market to pursue. And the fact that that larger market is right across the border is an excellent opportunity. And again, it goes back to how to ensure that Canada can maintain value in country of upgrading materials to support not just the development that will happen in the cell manufacturing and the vehicle manufacturing that will happen in Canada, but how we can export high value goods you know, to our friends in the United States. But one of the challenges is that as we've seen these investment waves and you see the amount of capital that the US government yep. is putting to work, for example, for us looking at a plant, we, we have the option of $150 million grant potentially toward that next site. I mean, that's a huge amount of capital deployment which swings our favor into needing to build that next site in the United States, while there are a lot of opportunities for us to look at building sites in Canada as well. Um, so if you think about five, 10 years out, where does your mind go? So I think, you know, not to, not to say that innovation is not going to be significant. I think people need to be realistic about how different a battery chemistry will look in five years. You know, five years is not actually that long of a period of time uh, in this type of development cycle. When you look at the first lithium ion battery from 1991, it was a lithium cobalt oxide cathode and a carbon based anode. And today, most batteries look pretty similar to that, right? Right. 30 odd years later. So I think that in the in the five year horizon, the ecosystem is going to look like building the chemistries of today, the materials of today, and everyone trying to reach that scale point to support the cell manufacturers who are coming to North America you know, primarily to support the auto manufacturers and bring plants online in 2025, 2026. And then when you start to go out on the 10 year horizon, this is where you really have the opportunity to drive new opportunities, new chemistries, new processes into specific segments of the market. And I think this is a really important thing to recognize as well that, and we've seen a lot more, you know, education around this and understanding from the public, from the investment community, from the government. You know, we used to talk about lithium ion batteries as a sector. Well, now we talk about EV and ESS as two different segments. Well, EV has a dozen segments under it, as, yeah. under it right? You know, passenger vehicles are different, different than semi-trucks or different than postal deliveries. They have different use profiles. They're going to have different technologies that are best to deploy. So I think in that five to 10 year horizon, we're really going to start to see chemistries tuning toward their focused use cases. Mm -hmm as we have such a huge diversity of use cases in what some consider still just one application of EVs. I'm wondering if, uh, as we close this off, if there's anything that, that uh, you want to add uh, to what we've talked about, if there's anything that we missed that you think is important for, uh, for uh, our members and, and viewers to know. 
I think I think we've hit a lot of good points. And one thing on that continued technology development, you know, this is something that Novonics has always been focused on. And, and we've really built a whole business providing services to the industry and how we can support in co-development projects demonstrating different technology platforms, right? Through our pilot lines in Nova Scotia, thousands of test channels. And it really gives us a, a unique lens across what is that technology mix going to look like? Where are those pros and cons to all of these different chemistries? And I think we really need to see continued collaboration across the sector. And it's why we're excited about groups like this to try to bring people together, both in the industry and in the, in the public sector, to show how we can drive toward our three-year goals, toward our five-year goals, and, and toward our 10-year goals, because we have to paint that map very clearly. And there's a lot of people that need to participate in supporting delivering those goals toward that electrified future. Absolutely. Listen, Chris, thanks so much for your time today. Novonix really is a great uh, story of Canadian innovation. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Great to be here.